community. So I'm going to share a message with you that I feel like God's been placing on my heart for the last couple of years. And it's going to be in John chapter 20, if you want to open up your Bibles and turn there this morning. Judas, when he betrayed Jesus, it says that Jesus went to a place where he would oftentimes meet with his disciples. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and Judas, when he chooses to betray him, meets Jesus in that garden. He goes up with all those soldiers, with the swords, with the clubs, and he kisses Jesus in a garden. It tells us later that when Jesus is on the cross, it says that Joseph of Arimathea and that Nicodemus came up and that they wanted to take the body of Jesus off that cross. And it says this in John chapter 19, verse 41. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So there was a garden, another garden in the scriptures. It tells us in John chapter 20 that Mary Magdalene, that she says, hey, I'm going to go with these other women. We're going to anoint the body of Jesus. And, and they all go to the tomb. And when they get there, that the stone is rolled away. Is it okay to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus and it not be Easter? Is that all right? It says that when she goes to the tomb, they discover this massive tomb, which would have had Roman soldiers guarding it, that that tomb has, and that rock has been rolled away. So she goes back to the disciples, and she tells the disciples, she says to them, hey, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and John respond. They take off running. They go towards the tomb, which I feel like is just a shame for Peter. Because poor old Peter, it's always recorded in the scripture that Peter took off first, John went, John got there first. So for all of eternity, it says that Peter was out of shape, right? And it says that they get to the tomb, they look in, and the body of Jesus is gone, and only the clothes of Jesus is left in the tomb. They return, and it says that Mary Magdalene stays there. In John chapter 20, it says this in verse 11. Follow with me. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Can we just pray for a moment? Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to learn more about you and to grow in our relationship with you this morning. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help us to know you better. And God, do a transformative work in us this morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Verse 15, thinking he was the gardener. Marty, back in 2016, we went up to Seattle, Washington. We went up to Washington to see her sister-in-law. And while we were there, we said, hey, we're pretty close to Canada. We should go up to Canada and check it out. And so that's what we did. We took a ferry. If you could bring a water. I did have COVID about a month ago, all right? And I'm still dealing with a little bit of cough that gets me every once in a while. So if you can bear with me on that. But we went up to Canada and took a ferry when we went up there. And, and there's this place called the Bachart Gardens. The Bachart Gardens. It's a beautiful place. You can see it on the screen. Tons of colors. Japanese gardens and, and Mediterranean gardens. Just beautiful. Everything's in bloom. And while we were there, I just thought to myself, I said, you know what? I said, I don't believe that this stuff happened by accident. I don't think that the garden's just like appear that way. I believe that there are caretakers of that garden who are helping to make sure that that garden is meticulous and beautiful the way it is, right? And I started to reflect on that. And I said, you know, I think that's what God did when he was creating that garden for Adam. It says in Genesis chapter 2 verses 8 through 9, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he creates this garden, one, to be good for food, those pineapples and probably bacon, and, and also trees that were just beautiful to look at, that you wanted to go and see and look at. 
It says also in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden, that it was a place of nourishment, that out of that garden was a water source, kind of like the temple in Ezekiel's vision, where the water flowed from the temple of God. And it goes on in Genesis 2.15, The Lord God took the man and put him in that garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And he says, I'm going to make Adam live there, and he's going to enjoy that garden. He's going to make it flourish. It's going to be a life-giving, thriving place. But we know the story, right? Adam turns his back on God. Adam and Eve choose disobedience. They choose sin. They turn their back on God. And it brings about sin and evil and consequences they never imagined. It says this in Genesis 3, through 24. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. He said, why did God say that? Why did he determine that that should be the case? Well, God, it says that Adam and Eve immediately felt shame and condemnation when they sinned. And God says, I don't want them to experience that forever. I don't want them to take, live forever in sin, shame, envy, lust, pride, all things evil in this world. He says, I don't want them to live with that for all of eternity. He says, so let's get them out of there. In verse 23, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. He gets Adam and Eve. He puts them out. He puts a sword there flaming, and he says, let's make sure that the way is kept as if guarded, not prohibited, that there is a way back into life-giving relationship with Jesus, with God. He says, but we don't want them to get in this way. And you say, well, what is the way? What is the way back into a life-giving relationship with God Almighty? Well, Jesus told us what the way was, right? John chapter 14, verse 6, when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. He says, I am the way. Not some meditation, not good citizenship, not the right political party, not good deeds. He says the right way is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you can get back into relationship with God Almighty. All you have to do is believe. I believe this, folks. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is God-breathed. Do y'all believe that? all scripture as if God himself said every single word in the Bible matters it is not a coincidence that John records that when Mary was at that tomb that she she said I thought he was the gardener Adam messed up he was there to make the world thrive and flourish he abandoned his job and here Jesus is and Mary's thinking he's the gardener. Of all the things she could have said, she could have said, I thought he was a bandit, a disciple. I thought he was a Roman soldier. But it says and it records that he is the gardener. You know why? He is the gardener. The gardener has returned to undo the work that Adam did. Adam said, I don't want to do this. I don't want the world to thrive. I don't want to be in relationship with you. And Christ has come back as if to say, if you've got to get something done, you've got to do it yourself. And he says... I'm the gardener who did not disobey. I'm the gardener who did not turn my back on my father. And I'm the gardener who has come to restore. If someone came to me and they said, and maybe you should just ask yourself this question as well. If someone came to you and said, hey, describe to me with one word what the whole Christian story is about. What is it all about? Could you do it? The one word I think I would use would be the word restoration. I think there are plenty of other good words. Love. You know, he loves us with an everlasting love for God so loved the world. I think grace is another good one. You know, we're saved by grace, by faith. But I think restoration's better. I think the whole story of God and humanity is about restoration. To restore things, to put things back in the original state. You and I were designed to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and said, I will restore that. That's what I want to talk about this morning. I just want to talk about how our gardener restores. And I've got a couple of things from the scripture that I just believe he restores in your life. And I believe he's here to do that work this morning. So can we just look at it? The first thing I think that God restores is joy. Psalm chapter 51, verse 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Restore to me of all things joy. 
COVID. I'm tired of it. Y'all tired of COVID? It's annoying. Restore to me joy. Restore to me joy. You know, there are people who need joy. I need joy. Joy is that delight and that gladness that the world can't take away, that when there's sorrow and when there's mourning and when there's pain and it comes to your house, joy is that thing that doesn't let it get down into your heart. And the Bible says that one of the things that he restores is joy. And there are a lot of people in this world that are not living joy-filled lives. There are plenty of people in this world, and maybe you're in here and you say, that's me. And you say, I haven't laughed in forever. I've been going through so much trial and circumstances and pain and situations and so many things that are so rough in my life. And you say, man, I just, I don't have joy anymore. The Bible says that we have a God and a gardener who says, I have come back to restore to you joy. I have come back to give you gladness and laughter. It's okay to laugh. It is all right to laugh, right? Can we laugh for just a moment in here? Is it all right? I, uh, when I got up to Louisville, I got up there and um, I was introducing myself quite a few times and I'd get up there and I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm Brandon McDaniel. I'm from Jessup, Georgia, which is just up the road. And they were like, no, it's not. It's 13 hours away. And I was like, okay, it doesn't work here, right? I love memes. I am the driest, lamest humor kind of guy. I like the dumbest humor. And, and if you don't know what a meme is, it's a picture with some kind of funny little thing that goes with it. Can I show you a couple of memes this morning? Can we just laugh? Let's show that first meme this morning. When you're working nursery and the pastor runs 15 minutes over. <laughs> now, I know Pastor Tony never goes over. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> See that next meme? It says, and what do we do when we're sad? Add to cart. No. How many of you get on Amazon and you add to cart? Marty, I love her. I get home. She's like, hey, there were all these things on a deal. I was like, if you spend 500 bucks on things that are a deal, it's not really a deal, is it? Let's see the next one. When you ask your dog what he's chewing and he starts chewing faster. <laughs> Go ahead. When you realize you only replied mentally and never actually sent the message. I do this all the time, all the time. Next, when the hibachi chef asks you if you can catch a shrimp in your mouth. <laughs> Next, me throwing the box, the food came in into the trash. Me going to the trash because I forgot how long the box said to cook the food. I do it all the time with brownies, brownies in particular, 30 minutes, 32 minutes. Next. Me doing something I'm perfectly capable of and have done before, but someone decides to watch. <laughs> Disc golf. All the time. Wrote a song called Pain at the Pump, and it goes something like, ah <laughs> It's a lot more expensive in Kentucky. Welcome to salsa class. Who's ready to learn how to dance? Me hiding a bag of tortilla chips. I think there's been a misunderstanding. <laughs> Where in the Bible does it say it's a man's job to wash dishes? Wife, 2 Kings 21, 13 says, And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I knew I'd get amens from that one. It's okay to laugh. The Bible says there's a time for mourning, but there's also a time for joy. There's a time for laughter. And the Bible says that God restores that. And sometimes I think we get so bogged down that we forget that. And you say, well, why do I need joy? The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Does anybody ever need strength in here? I do. When we moved up to Louisville, we moved up a week before coronavirus hit. We get up there. The first decision I had to make was that we weren't going to have church in person for three months. We get up there, and there are riots going on in the city in downtown Louisville. We get up there and we decide to have an election that year. I needed strength. And I looked to the Lord and I said, Lord, fill me and restore to me joy. I need joy. And he does that. Maybe you're dealing with a divorce. Maybe you're dealing with pain, whatever. The child won't talk to you. Whatever's going on in your life, that sin that you're struggling with, if you need joy, the Bible says that our gardener restores joy, that he'll give it to you.
It's not just that. He also restores to us our ruined places. Ruined places. It says this in Amos chapter 9, verse 14. I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. Ruined places are those places in our lives where we had dreams. Maybe it's a business venture. Or we thought this marriage was going to be this way. Or a relationship with our children was going to be this way. Or the purpose or the self-esteem. And now it looks like it's in rubble and ruin. We see all these images on TV right now, right, of Ukraine. And we see the ruin. It looks like a dystopian society that you would see in movies. We look at it and we go, man, that's going to... That's going to be tough to rebuild that. But the Bible says that that's something that God does. He takes those ruined places that are beat down, and he says, and I will restore those things in your life, those areas of your life. If you say, man, I just, my faith isn't like what it used to be, he will restore that. He can, and he will, and he desires to restore those areas in your life. If you will just trust him and say, Lord, do this work in me. And when he restores it, he doesn't just restore it and say, oh, but I'm going, to li- I'm going to leave it all chipped and, and broken and looking like it's in decay. It says that when he restores, look at it. It says they will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens. It looks like a garden. And he makes it flourish. Your marriage will flourish. It will be better. It will be better. No matter how hard you think it is, that area of sin in your life where you're like, oh, man, I'm struggling right now. The Bible says that God will restore those things in your life, and it will be better. The marriage will be better. The relationship with your daughter will be better. The relationship with your son will be better. Or with your parents will be better. Or your marriage will be better. If you will trust him. He restores those ruined places. It's going to take some time sometimes, right? I look at those images on TV and I think, man, that's going to take time. God is a God who can do a supernatural work and restore like this. I believe that. But he also sometimes, it takes time to restore. It's going to take time to rebuild Ukraine. And God says, it might take some time. It might take you going to Christian counseling. It might. But he's going to restore, and he's working that work. The Bible also tells us that he will restore your unhealthy and wounded places. Your unhealthy and wounded places. Jeremiah 30, verse 17. I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. That our God says, I want to restore health in your life. And that goes for all kinds of health. That goes for the kind of health that is inward, like anxiety and stress. That stuff, I didn't say it was a sin. I said it's an unhealthy place for us. Maybe it's self-esteem or suicide. It doesn't matter what it is. The Bible says that our God is the type of God who cares for you and wants to restore health to you. It says this in Psalm 3.3, But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head. He wants to lift up your head when you deal with all those struggles and the darkness and, the, and you're depressed and you're at home and, and you just don't know what hope there is. God is a God who says, I want to lift up your head and give you hope. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 24, Gracious words are a honeycomb sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. That the words that he speaks into our lives are words to bring us healing and to mend our wounds. And he can do it. Amen? On this side of eternity, he can do it. It says this in Exodus 15, 26, For I am the Lord who heals you. Malachi 2, 4, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And it says in Isaiah 53, 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And we can be healed. We can be mended in all kinds of ways. We can receive that ointment that comes from him. The the Bible says that there's a balm in Gilead that mends those wounds. Some of us, we have scars from pains. And I was thinking about this. Scars are those things that have healed over time. Some Some of us in here, we have open wounds. We just were hurt. We were just hurt. Somebody, the kid just cussed us out. The, the marriage, we just got into an argument. And you have an open wound. And the, and the Bible says that we have a God that says, I'm going to come in there. I'm going to take that bomb from Gilead. I'm going to take it and I'm going to spread that ointment over you. And I'm going to heal you. I'm going to mend you. And you're going to be strong in that area again. 
But that takes healing, and that takes time sometimes too. Those open wounds, when you put alcohol on it, it hurts. It hurts, it stings, but it's worth it because you're going to heal. The Bible says that our God restores those kind of things in your life, and he restores one more thing, one, one more thing. He says, I restore what's been taken from you. The Bible says this in Joel chapter 2, verse 25. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts, and the locust swarm. I somewhat feel like they just kind of got lazy there, and they were just like, locust, locust, the other locusts, and somebody's locust. And the locusts in ancient Israel, this is how I preach at my church, all right? I'm very much myself, and I ramble on sometimes, but I do think that it would be a devastating thing if locusts came into an agricultural society and just destroyed the crops. He says, and I'm going to restore those things. I'll restore it. Because the Bible says that we fight a spiritual battle, right? That we are in spiritual warfare. Ephesians talks about it. That there's not, every, not everything's flesh and blood. That there's an enemy at work against our soul to defeat us. And he bombards us and he steals from us. He steals purpose, steals faith, steals joy, steals so many things. And the Bible says that our God is a God who restores. Job chapter 42 verse 10. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job and gave him twice as much as he had. Twice as much. He didn't just give him enough. He says, I'm going to give you overflowing vats more than enough. Your character is going to be better than before. That area of sin that, that the enemy was constantly bombarding you with, that's going to be a place where you have victory. And not only that, you're going to minister in that very area because that's the kind of restoration our Lord does. About a year and a half ago, Marty had her identity stolen. And it took time for restitution. It may take time for restoration, but he will restore because he's the gardener. I like what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's a very fancy verse to say. You have no idea what kind of restoration work God wants to do in your life. You just can't even imagine it. You don't know to what level you will experience restoration. Because, folks, the story of God is the story of restoration. That's what he does. That's what he does. He's a restoring God. And you say, not for me. Not for my life. Yes, it is. That's the keyboard player comes to the stage. I'm going to share this with you. This is my story. Can I tell you my story of restoration? Some of you know it. Some of you may not. My story is this. I was raised by my grandmother and my aunt. And years ago, when I was growing up, my, I was raised by them because my mother went to Desert Storm and at 10 months old gave me to my grandmother. And so, really, I'll be honest with you, growing up, I never thought much about who my father was because he wasn't in this entire equation. We didn't know who my father was. The only thing that my mother knew about my father was two things. One, that his name was Todd, and two, that he was a businessman from the Atlanta area. Those are the only two details. So I grow up, maybe as a kid I ask a little bit about who my father is, but years pass and, and I don't, I'm not asking anything. I enjoyed my life. I think my aunt and grandma did as good of a job as they could have done and I enjoyed my life with them. Fast forward to 2019. In 2019, there was a Black Friday sale around Thanksgiving for Ancestry DNA kits. And I said, well, I want to find out whether I'm Scottish, Irish, or or whatever I am and wherever I'm from. And so I take this test and it turns out I'm 24% Jewish, all you Gentiles in here. But I get on there and, and I see, if you don't know how it works, there's this thing called centimorgans, a measurement called centimorgans. And if you are related to somebody on Ancestry DNA and they've also taken the test, then it will show you all those people and second cousins, third cousins and all this stuff and it puts them into categories and it lets you know what they are. Well, I had one guy in particular that was in a category, couldn't quite tell if he's uncle or grandfather or what he was, but he was, he was definitely closer to me. So I reach out to him, send him an email. I said, hey, um, I seem to be related to you somehow. So we, we go back and forth in emails. And he says, you're definitely part of the family by blood and DNA. He says, why don't we meet? So we met in Monroe at the Cotton Cafe at the time. And uh, we meet there. And uh, he says, 
well, you know, uh, this is the family. It's a big old family, et cetera, et cetera, and it was great. And somewhere along the way, he goes, I was talking to my son Todd the other day, blah, blah, blah. And I went, hold on, hold on one sec. You can't just, hold on. I said, let me give you this. I've got two details. He's a businessman from the Atlanta area, and his first name's Todd. He goes, okay. <laughs> that complicates things a little bit, because this is an elderly gentleman. He was in his 70s. He says, all right. He's got a wife, and Todd has two daughters. So let me navigate this. I said, okay. I'm not here to stir anything up. And uh, he talks to his son. We end up setting up a meeting at Panera. Todd, his wife, Madi, and me. We're sitting there. And it's a very intense conversation. It's not the kind of conversation, you know, it's not, oh my gosh, I can't imagine what life, it was none of that kind of stuff. It was very tense, scoping one another out. He said, hmm, we leave. I call Ancestry DNA. Talk to a representative. I said, hey, is it possible this elderly man I met with, is he my grandfather or my uncle? They said, no way he's your grandfather. I said, okay. I called Todd back. I said, don't worry about it. I'm related to you. Just don't know how. A couple months later, my grandma takes an Ancestry DNA, the one that I grew up with. She's got the same exact measurements as that elderly man I met with. Y'all following me this morning? No? Okay. All right, great. I end up meeting. I, I, I see that she has the same measurement. So I call Todd. I say, hey, um, can we do a test? He says, yeah, let's do a lab court DNA test. I'm driving down the road over here towards Faith Presbyterian, and I'm checking my email while driving. I would encourage no one to do that, but I check my email and almost swerve off the road when it says he is 99.999999% your father. And I'm 31 years old. He gets his papers in the mail the next day. We call, and on July 4th, Madi and I, with her big old pregnant belly, and my father, and my stepmother and my two sisters are all meeting on July 4th at Chick-fil-A. We're sitting there together having breakfast. A month later, my father is in St. Mary's all night long when my first daughter and his granddaughter is born. Can I tell you that that was a story of restoration? that I did not even think was possible. But all I know is that my God so long ago was orchestrating and working and saying, I will do something you can't wrap your mind or your heart around because that's what our gardener does. He restores and he brings life. And I am just so convinced that he does it over and over again and he will do it for you no matter what you're facing. If you need restoration, Christ is here to do it right now. You say, is it going to happen like this? No, but I can tell you the restoration process will happen like this. It will begin for you. And he will restore.